This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 460, recorded on September 19th, 2020. 17. This episode is brought to you by the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, part of the U.S. Department of Defense. The agency's Chemical and Biological Technologies Department hosts the 2017 Chemical and Biological Defense Science and Technology Conference to exchange information on the latest and most dynamic developments for countering chemical and biological weapons of mass destruction. Find out more at cbdstconference.com. Hey, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Today, we are coming to you from the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This is our second TWIV in Philadelphia. The first one was number 33 about nine years ago. We were here for the ASM general meeting, and we they said to us, why don't you come and we'll live stream it and we'll have an audience. So uh, Dixon de Pommier and I went, Alan Dove went. I think our guest was Raul Andino. And there was one person in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> but she was from the National Academy of Sciences. She was a PR person, so that was a good person to have there. And afterwards, many years later, uh, Chris Kondian from ASM said, you had a lot of persistence to keep on going after that. And here we are at 460. We have a good audience today, so thanks for coming. So we have uh, four guests from, uh, let's see, there's a medical school, a dental school, and a veterinary school here, right from those different schools here at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, on my left, Susan Weiss. Welcome to TWIV. Thank you. And Susan has, uh, yeah, you got to hold your okay. mic so that they can hear you. <laughs> Susan has been involved in the uh, arrangement of this, so thank you for that. Uh, to her left, Carolina Lopez. Welcome to TWIV. Hi, thank you. And over next to Carolina, Gary Cohen. Welcome to TWIV. Pleasure. And finally, at the end, uh, we've put him all the way down there because he has some kind of respiratory disease. <laughs> <laughs> Scott Hensley, welcome to TWIV. And if, if you can't hear any of them at any time, raise your hand and we'll make them get closer to the mics, okay? But uh, this is being recorded, of course. You can always watch it again if you'd like. <laughs> so I want to start, as I always do on TWIV, by finding out a little bit about our guests. I forgot to tell you what we're doing here, by the way. <laughs> we're going to find out a little bit about you, your training, what you've done over the years, how you got here. And we'll talk a little bit about your work. Um, and then I have a few kind of general questions at the end uh, to uh, kind of illustrate who you are. So let's see. Uh, I, I have an order here. Not that it matters, but it's easy for me to scroll down. Let's start with Gary, the youngest person on this panel. <laughs> right? Excuse me? <laughs> uh, yes. All right, Gary, I want to ask you, tell us... Um, where you're from and your training and where you got your degrees, your, your postdoc and all of that and how you ended up here. Uh, okay. Where are you from? Where are you from? <clears throat> well, as soon as I open my mouth, you'll realize that I come from Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> you might recognize Yes, it. I do recognize the accent um, for sure. <laughs> and um, I was a street urchin, uh, <laughs> went to Boys High, which is very famous in New York. Uh, Brooklyn College, um, uh, U.S. Army, uh, played at Sloan Kettering as a technician for a while, was uh, wound up as a graduate student at the University of Vermont in um, agricultural biochemistry, uh, worked on Azotobacter in Landii. Um, and fell in love with virology through a guy by the name of Wes Wilcox, who uh, worked uh, with Harry Ginsburg here, you know, very close. And he seduced me to come back to Philadelphia 
and uh, did a postdoc at the vet school on vaccinia, which was a far cry from a nitrogen-fixing microorganism, um, and was offered a job at the dental school uh, at the time when the University of Pennsylvania was separating the uh, disciplines, uh, meaning that the medical school taught microbiology and biochemistry to the whole campus. And uh, the uh, university decided to separate the vet school first, created uh, microbiology at the vet school, and uh, then um, increased the departments at the dental school, and that's where I went and stayed. This was your first faculty position? This was my first and last, <laughs> unless you have a better offer. <laughs> never know. Never, never say know. last. You never know, right? Yeah. No. It's, um, I guess, uh, you'll understand from interviewing the people on my left and right why I stayed at Penn. Okay. It's not the cheesesteaks, right? Uh, no, it's not the cheesesteaks. <laughs> and if you like cheese whiz and come from Switzerland, uh, you're an oddity in this world. So uh, we have, as always in science, there's not many degrees of separation. It's really interesting. Right. So Harry Ginsburg yes. was chair of Micro here, right? Yes. Did he, did he hire you, actually? You know, you're in no, the, Harry, uh, Harry almost school. hired me. But um, I was so intimidated by him and Seymour Cohen, uh, who some of you may know. I think he's still alive, Seymour Cohen. Um, I was so intimidated that I, I wouldn't take the job at the uh, medical school. So, but Harry, Harry left. Harry made a great impression on me. And then I'm sure, and I know he made a great impression at Columbia. Yeah, so he came to Columbia after here. Right. He was chair of microbiology, which is my department. He actually hired me. Did he? So okay. he had a little lapse in judgment at that point. <laughs> he hired me. Uh, and then, of course, he left. He went to the NIH. He retired and uh, went to the NIH to do experiments right. uh, on adenovirus. And he was at the bench often. I saw him at chair. You know, in his 60s, he was at the bench. He, he really liked doing experiments. Well, he had a technician by the name of Mary Dixon, who would, who you probably know. Uh, I remember him. Yeah. And Mary had a hatchet, and anybody that wanted to come there, <laughs> Harry, when he was at the bench, would get chopped off at the knees. <laughs> so it was just not, that, that was his routine. Okay, well, we'll get back to you with some science. Uh, Susan, where you? You're not from Brooklyn, right? No, nope, but I'm from Manhattan. Manhattan. <laughs> you're born in Manhattan. I was born in Manhattan on the Upper West Side, uh, but grew up mostly in Yonkers in the suburbs. So I don't have quite as much accent as Gary, <laughs> but still New York. Um, and I went to Roosevelt High School in Yonkers, and then to Brandeis for undergrad, and then um, I did my PhD at Harvard Med School uh, with Michael Bratt. Uh, working on NDV, Newcastle disease virus. So I was a virologist from the beginning, and I actually wanted to work on bacterial genetics with John Beckwith. That's what I really wanted to do when I went to grad school, but his lab was full. Mm -hmm. So I tried a virus lab, and I really liked it a lot. So I decided that's what I wanted to do. Virology was pretty new at the time, pretty um, growing, and it was pretty exciting. Um, and then I went to uh, UCSF for my postdoc with, with Mike Bishop and Harold Varmus, which was a really exciting place to be in the late 70s, mm. and worked on retrovirus uh, RNA. So again, I worked on mostly on transcription or gene expression in both of those labs. And then I was hired by Neil Nathanson to come here in 1980. Um, and uh, I was still, I, was, I, I decided that it wasn't a good time to start a lab working on retroviruses because it was so competitive. It was sort of just at the time HIV mm. was um, discovered and it was, um, oncogenes was really what people were studying. So I decided to do something completely different and I went back to my RNA virus uh, roots and um, saw that coronaviruses were a, a new kind of field so um, I decided to start my lab doing coronaviruses. 
And with the influence of Neil and, um, and Don Gilden, I, st I, I started working on an animal model, which is something I'd never done before. So coming here under their influence was kind of changed my, my direction quite a bit. Um, and I've been here ever since, too. Like Gary, it's the only mm -hmm. faculty job I've had 37 years. Wow, it's impressive. We'll yeah. see if, if the same holds true for the rest of our panel. Is anyone else from Brooklyn or Manhattan in the audience? You're from Brooklyn? Nobody else? Uh, okay. Nobody else will admit it. <laughs> I've just encountered many, many scientists over the years who are from Brooklyn or Manhattan, but that is obviously changing. <laughs> and the new generation of scientists is, uh, are going to be from uh, other places as well. Uh, Carolina, where are you from? Okay, so I, I was born in Santiago in Chile. Yeah. Uh, and then I moved to a smaller, much smaller city in the north, in the, I would say, in the middle of the Atacama Desert, kind of uh, grow up there. Um, and I decided to go back to Santiago to study biochemistry. Uh, so I, I had a professional degree and a master's degree in biochemistry in Chile. And, and, and then after that, when you are you know, uh, far away, you wonder what do you want to do next and how do you want to do it? So with my husband, we decided we needed to go out. And the, the, most people, what they do, go out for a few years and you never think you're going to stay abroad, right? You, you're not doing that because you want to stay abroad. You just want to learn and come back. And, you know, it's not necessarily how it works. So I came and I was uh, for a year <clears throat> at NYU uh, as a tech trying to understand how the system works in the U.S. And to be honest, I don't think I understood it until a year ago. <laughs> um, and then I, I went to Mount Sinai. We both, with my husband, went to Mount Sinai in New York. So we shared that too, right? So I trained. I did my PhD at Sinai as a student. I was there for a long time. So again, coming from a totally different background, my history is totally different from uh, my neighbors here. So I actually didn't know, I, and it's very honest that I said that I didn't know how things work. And I never appreciated a lot of things that now I understand in terms of networking and politics and science and all this stuff. So my, my path was finding a lab and a place that I really liked what I do and I stick to the science, and stick to that. So I actually did that. So I did a lot of the things that people usually say don't do. I stayed in my first line, the same lab as a postdoc and as I actually started as a research uh, assistant professor there for a long time. I had babies in grad, in grad school. My husband was doing the same and all these kind of weird things. So uh, then my kids was getting, were getting older. My older kid was uh, about to start high school. So if I wanted ever to really start an independent career, that was the time. Uh, so that's when I started looking for jobs and here I am, actually. I think Susan had a big role in me being here. Uh, I met Susan. Um, I invited her. I was, I had, because I, had, I was at China for a long time as a trainee and all that, I had the opportunity to organize a symposium at some point. And I was looking for people that worked in virus-host interactions. And it actually was very impressive to me how few people in the surrounding cities, because we couldn't really fly people from far, work in that. And I just found Susan online and I invited her to that symposium and that's how I met her. And um, well, and actually I'm here, I think big degree because of Susan. So uh, I ended in the vet school. So when I was looking for jobs, my husband actually said, okay, this position reads like you, but it was in the vet school. And I was like, I've never been in a vet school. What am I gonna be doing in a vet school? Uh, so I just came and say, okay, well, actually I came because my group, they said, you have to go, it's Penn, you know, go, you know, it's Penn, it's going to be okay. And I came, visit, and literally stepping inside the door, I realized, oh, this is a fantastic place. Um, so here I am. And so you also have, it's your first job, and you've been here yeah. ever since. Yeah, yeah, not that long, but yeah, seven <laughs> is it, years Is now. it your last job? Uh, well, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So uh, you've been here seven years, yes. and I understand you were recently tenured, is that right? Uh, last year, That's pretty recent. Yeah. Very good. Congratulations yeah, on you. that. All right. And that leaves us with Scott. Where are you from? Yeah, so I'm from a, a small farming town called uh, Manchester, Maryland. So how, how many people here are from Manchester? <laughs> 
So same, it was a really same small, as from Chile. Yeah, really small town. Uh, I remember when a McDonald's was put there, and it was like the end of the world, right? That we actually had a restaurant. Uh, so I went to the University of Delaware as an undergrad. At that point, I was really naive. I, I uh, started as a chemical engineer, and uh, I changed that within a week. My major was changed. I, I was bad at chemistry and not very good at math. Uh, <laughs> went to mechanical engineering. I uh, did psychology for a while and ended with biology and uh, start working with cucumber beetles and I was doing some phylogenetic work. I uh, wasn't completely on board with research and uh, I actually went to the University of Vermont. Uh, interesting to, to learn that, that Gary was there as well. So I went there for two years. I started grad school at University of Vermont and that's, that's kind of where I uh, you know, start falling in love with research. I was studying gene therapy at the time uh, and um, my girlfriend, who's now my wife, was living here in Philadelphia. So uh, I, I, I vividly remember uh, going on this hike in Shelburne, Vermont. It's you know, 10 miles outside Burlington, Vermont. And uh, it's the middle of the winter, and uh, the pond, they call it a pond, but it was more like a lake. It was frozen. People were, were, were ice skating. Uh, you know, people were ice fishing. And I was like, what the heck am I doing here, right? This is... You know, my girlfriend's down in Philly. And so I, uh, I, I transferred. I actually drove my application down here to Penn, and I became a grad, grad student at Penn. Uh, and I studied uh, adenoviruses and innate immunity to adenoviruses with Gundierdel at the Wistar Institute. And then I went on to do a postdoc with Johnny Dell and Jack Benick at the NIH and came back as a faculty member at the Wistar Institute seven years ago. And I recently just uh, moved over here to the micro department at Penn. And... Uh, yeah, so that, that girl I was chasing is now my wife, and now I have uh, uh, you know, a respiratory virus uh, due to uh, you know, our offspring. <laughs> <laughs> so you also have been here your entire career. Yeah, seven unusual. years. Carolina and I came about the same time. And uh, it's unusual to have people in one place uh, for their whole careers. So there's obviously either they're all, they all have problems or... <laughs> There's something special about this place that keeps people here. Uh, I have been also at, at Columbia my entire career, um, but people do move around because sometimes that's what you need to do to, to get ahead. Um, Scott, when you went to college, uh, you were going to be an engineer, you said, right? Mm -hmm. uh, was there any science uh, in, your, in your family that would have influ influenced you to do that? No, no, not really. You know, I, I, was, I was completely naive. I, I look at some of the undergrads now and some of the grad students. It's, it's amazing how, how put together some of the kids are nowadays. When I was 18, 19, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Uh, I just knew I did, I, I did well in high school, and I just felt like, hey, you know, chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, that sounds like... Uh, that sounds like a good profession. Had no idea what it was. And so you know, during college, I, I really just sort of hopped around a lot, uh, trying to uh, get a feel of what I wanted to do. And eventually just ended up with biology. And it, was, it, it wasn't until I moved to Vermont until I really you know, got, got in the thick of things and doing experiments and uh, you know, realized that this is something I wanted to do for okay, so you, forever. Okay, so you discovered science on your own, essentially. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So Gary, what about you? Was there, before you went to college, was there some science influence, or did you find it on your own as well? Uh, how, I didn't know anyone who graduated from a past high school. That was my upbringing. And in fact, I was the first person in both families that graduated from, from college, and uh, a you know, further degree was unheard of. So the answer is, uh, I learned my science on the streets of the, of Brooklyn, <laughs> and sort of uh, worked my way into it. I, I can't say that there was any. Uh, maybe the only person I could blame it on is Paul De Kloof, uh, from his books, and uh, he was at Rockefeller, right. And I think it was uh, the reading of those kinds of books that encouraged me to get into this racket. Okay. Racket. It's an interesting word for it. <laughs> Carolina, what about you? Did you have some science in your family that influenced you? Yeah, that's interesting. So my, my dad is a physician. My mom is a nurse. And I had it very clear very early on that I didn't want to do anything with that. But I really like research. I actually like researching things. And I, I, I recently said this in another podcast. I really um, 
always remember a research that I needed to do in the, uh, on the history of the guitar, right, in the school. And at the time, you had to write and draw. We didn't have computers and all that. And I, I always liked this thing. So when I was in high school deciding where to go next, um, in Chile, you don't have college. So you really have to, for most places, you really have to pick your real direction in high school. 90% of the people do. So my counselor in high school was walking, I remember the moment, was walking behind us in a room. What do you want to do? What do you like? And do you have you thought about this? And, I, and I, I'm like, I don't know. I like research, but I don't want to be a physician. I loved physics. I wanted to study, you know, to be an astronomer. But then I realized that that was, I had to be a physicist at the time. And that was to me too, I don't know, cold, mainly. I don't, didn't, I don't know what. Um, so he walked, she walked behind me and said, have you heard of biochemistry? <laughs> and I'm like, that's what I want to do. <laughs> and, and literally, that's going to, and that's what I did. And, and then the virology came, actually, a friend I have in my biochemistry. We were only 10 people in that um, generation of biochemistry in that university. And, and one of my friends had had some experiences with viruses. So she loved viruses and she kept telling us how virus is so little and so smart and they do so many things. And I got like, okay, this is what I want to do, viruses. And, you know, and that's, I mean, here I am. So when that person asked you, hey, did you want to do biochemistry, had you heard of that before? I never or, heard the word. It just sounded good. But I, it sounded like <laughs> biology and chemistry and, all, and, okay. and research. And she explained a little bit of what it was about and it sounded perfect. Susan, how about you? Yeah, I, my family had no background in science at all, but all my cousins are doctors. I'm, so the generation before us, there was really nothing. Uh, some college, some not college. Um, I got interested in science, I think, from high school, where uh, I really loved my chemistry class. I had a really good teacher. Uh, chemistry and math were the things I liked. So when I went to Brandeis, I thought I'd major in chemistry. And then I, you know, Brandeis has really good liberal arts stuff. So I really wavered and thought about all kinds of majors during those years. But um, in the end, I, I ended up majoring in, in biology. And um, we had lots of opportunities for undergrad research, even back in 1970. And um, I worked in a bacterial genetics lab, and I really liked that a lot, which is why I wanted to do that in grad school. So, And then, as I said, I got into virology from my rotation in a virus lab with, with Michael. All right, let's talk a little science. Uh, let's start with Gary. By the way, Gary, another famous Brooklynite scientist is Tony Fauci. Know that? And his family owned a pharmacy, and it was called Fauci Pharmacy. And you can, if you Google it, you can find pictures of it. I think that's pretty cool. You know, you know who Tony Fauci is, right? Okay, good. You should. He's a champion for us. You know, he, he has to go in front of Congress all the time and say why it's important for us to have this money to do research, and he's from Brooklyn. I went and looked at your papers, Gary, and uh, after about a half hour getting through all of them, many, many pages on PubMed, I, I found what I think is the first one, 1971, close. Okay, uh, in virology. Well, it was the one on page, you know, Oh, whatever. 10. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere back there. Deoxyribonucleic acid synthesis in synchronized mammalian KB cells infected with herpes simplex virus. Do you remember that? Uh, yes. Yeah, you do? <laughs> what was the magnesium concentration? Um, Just it's kidding. Interesting. It was <clears throat> uh, the, the question that usually was raised at, uh, in, when doing anything on DNA synthesis was, have you checked the pools? Right, which was sort of a stupid question to disarm the, uh, the speaker. And in fact, I did check the pools with a, a great uh, postdoc named Barbara Roller. And she led me into, into areas of DNA replication that I really hadn't understood. But that, that, um, those series of, of experiments uh, were really very important because <clears throat> it led into uh, questions about how do you block viral DNA synthesis with inhibitors and uh, what what I had done was to use thymidine, uh, high levels of thymidine, 
and uh, which are converted into the triphosphate form, and they block viral, uh, they block uh, host cell uh, DNA synthesis. Well, they didn't block HSV, and which led to why in the world wouldn't they block HSV uh, synthesis, and uh, it which led to um, a person by the name of Len Bello saying, my goodness, it must have something to do with thymidine kinase, which led into um, ribonucleotide reductase. And um, the concept was that it was a, a new uh, viral-induced uh, protein that controlled uh, DNA replication in cells. And that was a, a revelation for me. And at the time, virology, at least in herpes, was looking for different mechanisms for drugs to inhibit um, uh, replication. And uh, ribonucleotide reductase, there was just an anecdote on this. Um, the, the enzyme led to a change in my career. Um, because I was getting into uh, heavy-duty biochemistry. And um, I said, do I really want to go here? Asked my friends at Penn to come. I was going to give them a seminar and said, ask them, what should I do? And they said, drop it. <laughs> and <clears throat> I took their advice and dropped it. And um, it, it's one of my babies. And ribonucleotide reductase has taken many forms, um, including vaccine, and uh, it's used uh, the the viral ribonucleotide reductase it has now been utilized in the field. So it's it's fun to look back on that on those series of experiments. But I haven't I haven't touched it in X number of years. But but you've continued with herpes simplex virus since then, right? But, yeah, but uh, it's been um, it's been simplex for a large number of years. <laughs> so, if you look at your publication since then, suddenly you got interested in viral glycoproteins. Where did that come from? <clears throat> um, it it came from uh, trying to hustle money out of NIH. Um, what my, my mentor, Wes Wilcox, had written a grant on doing the same kinds of things with vaccinia virus uh, to develop a pox virus vaccine, which I revisited later in life. Uh, but uh, I, at that time, no one really knew anything about, about the virus. And I figured, well, if I can uh, develop purification procedures to separate this mass of antigens, then uh, I might be able to distinguish what's going on with uh, viral neutralization or how viruses get into, or these viruses get into a cell. So uh, worked out purification procedures and a protein dropped out of uh, the procedure, and I made antibody to it in a rabbit, and the antibody neutralized virus, and it turned out to be a single protein. And uh, it was uh, uh, later by the field termed, uh, so the, the herpes virus glycoproteins, and there are, are probably 12 in the envelope of the virus. Um, at the time that most people were working on it, uh, as you know, there are multiple, multiple herpes viruses, and everybody had their own name for the different glycoproteins. And it was the Tower of Babel, and no one could figure out if they were working on this protein or that protein. So uh, in a moment of uh, sheer brilliance, the group got together and said, so let's call them uh, uh, A, B, C, D. Uh, and uh, A disappeared, 
uh, F disappeared. So there was a whole series, and now it goes up to, I don't know, M, K, you know. Um, and so the argument always was to try and dissociate, uh, characterize, and say, what does it look like? What does it do, and how does it do it? And those three questions have been uh, sort of, but 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 I, ha I have to say that this this is still early times, and my collaboration with uh, a colleague at the vet school, once again the vet school came in, uh, Raz Eisenberg, um, resulted in a I don't know forty year uh, collaboration uh, in so. I was alone on the papers, and then probably <clears throat> in 1977, Raz became uh, a colleague, and you know all the papers after that are with her. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. If you look at your publication list, all of a sudden Raz appears, and then consistently together you're yeah. publishing. How did that start? Oh, story that I won't tell. Okay. Um, <laughs> But uh, Raz, Raz uh, 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 was at the vet school, and uh, she was working on streptococcus and uh, doing very well. And we just started talking, and uh, uh, she found the systems that I, I was working on so interesting, uh, she switched. And... Uh, you know, we just never looked back. And, you know, all of our grants were together, and it was a, a relationship that lasted a very long time. She's retired as of uh, uh, June of this year. So would you say that a good collaboration is important for science? Uh, well, it was important for my science. Um, and I think it was... I think it's it's critical, and I think the ability to uh, and and Susan and I have talked about this multiple times, the ability to lay a stupid uh, uh, idea on a person who is not going to value you uh, harshly, and then realize that it, if it may have been stupid to begin with. It evolved into something that could be tested. And I think that uh, was clearly my the major benefit for, for me. So uh, there are, as you said, a dozen glycoproteins. glycoproteins. There are many attachment receptors as well, right? Um, well, this, this has always been uh, the, the problem in the field. And... Um, the, there are four glycoproteins that are, are strictly involved with um, membrane fusion. And the virus, uh, you can remove almost every one of the glycoproteins except these four. And once again, they're alphabetically, they're, they're D and HL and B. And you can pluck them out of the virus, uh, translate them in a cell, and with the proper receptor, uh, you can get cell-cell fusion. Um, and uh, probably another uh, critical, to use a terrible word, watershed in our lives was a collaboration with Pat Spear and her lab and all of the wonderful people in our lab and her lab. Uh, and she invited us in to... Uh, understanding the receptors, uh, and there are three receptors for HSV, for simplex one and two, and there are HVM, uh, which is a TNF receptor, which turns out to be an absolute key molecule in the regulation of B and T cells, um, nectin, which is an adhesion molecule, and 3OST, and the virus uh, selected uh, these two receptors, which are key in in immune uh, uh, 
in, in the immune system and in adsorption. Uh, and GD is the receptor binding protein. And once again, we asked, what do they look like? What do they, uh, what do they do? And how do they do it? And, um, the, uh, another segment, uh, of my life, her life, our lives was, uh, absolutely exciting. Um, and I go on, but so you're going to have to, uh, with, with x-ray crystallographers, um, Don Wiley, uh, Andre Coffey, and I think, I think if my major contribution was to take these people who couldn't care less about herpes <laughs> and interest them in, in herpes virus. So. so in fact, the herpes viruses share proteins with polioviruses as Absolutely. receptors, and that got us that got us to have a, we actually have a paper together. Yes, on PRL. Yeah, so, and this is another example of a collaboration. We wanted to do some virus receptor affinity studies, and we heard you had a BioCore. This is over 10 years ago now. Oh, yeah. And we didn't have one at Columbia, or actually some people had them, but they wouldn't share them with us. There's another story, right? <laughs> so... Uh, we heard you had one. He said, hey, I called you uh, or maybe emailed you at the time and said, would you be interested in studying polio, polio receptor? And Yeah, and you did it, and uh, it was a good collaboration, and we published that. So it, I think it pushes science forward when people does this instead of, instead of doing everything on their own. Right? I'm going to get back to you at the end. We have some more questions for you. But Carolina, I would like to ask you a couple of things about your science. I found a paper of yours about defective viral genomes, which are danger signals for the triggering of lung antiviral immunity. And I found that interesting. So why don't you explain that to us? Okay, so uh, <laughs> where do I start? You're gonna be talking about this and it's hard to stop me. So I can uh, just pull the plug, right? Yeah. <laughs> so let me go more or less historical because I think that's actually a cool story. So I trained as an immunologist. So I was in the microbiology at Sinai, a lot of virologists around me, but I was in an immunology training program. So I was always looking for um, how these immunological cells get activated uh, in response to viruses, because that's what I liked. And we had these viral strains uh, that had this very, very different um, uh, impact on dendritic cells, that's what we were talking, these cells that are really key for stimulating the immune response. So the viruses look very similar, and one were very potently stimulating these dendritic cells to activate themselves and induce immunity, and the other viruses was like putting water into the cells. Yeah, and these are influenza viruses. Uh, this was done with Sendai virus, yeah. but we did the same things with influenza. Um, so we got very excited. I got very excited because I thought this is really cool. Uh, if we learn what is different in these viruses, we can learn a lot about what are the um, important things to trigger antiviral immunity. So um, I was in an environment at Sinai where it was all about antiviral antagonists or antagonists, right? Viral antagonists of the antiviral response. So that's where we started. We started thinking, uh, well, should we clone and sequence all these viruses and proteins and figure out what is the difference? Why, why, when, what is the antagonist? And I actually did clone both the strains to find out that they are very, very similar. So after a long uh, discussion with people, we actually uh, talked to Jerome Schulman, uh, which was um, at Sinai, uh, <coughs> Emeritus at that point, just sitting in an office, really trying to help everyone. And he goes back to me and says, you know, you have to look for defective viral genomes. And I was like, that's lame. That's really boring. You know, it's, that's not what we were expecting. So he insisted, it has to be, you know, that's why you grow the viruses on an MI of 0 0.001, because we all know. And, and, you know, I went and researched the literature. This was 2000-ish, 2005, probably. And actually, yeah, I realized there is all this tremendous literature about this in the 70s and 80s, and then nothing, right? White. So, uh, so we went and looked, and I had a student at the, at the time. I, I was already a postdoc or something after a postdoc, I don't remember, with a student. And I, I said, you know, well, let's go for this. Let's just prepare viruses, high defective genomes, low defective genomes, and see what happens. And that was actually the biggest great experiment, right? When we, when we saw that this was 
totally outcomes. We were mimicking the strain differences. So I remember walking to Tom's office and saying, well, we did the experiment. That was my PI. And it actually, day and night, is really clearly these defective genomes. He looked at me and said, you know, you can make a career out of that. I'm like, like I know. I really want to go back and research this, right? So that's where, what it is. So yeah, we started really going into a lot of in vitro work and trying to convince ourselves. So everything that was known about defective genomes is that they were exist, that they interfere with replication, and no matter what virus you look for them, people were funding them. But really at the time, virologists and immunologists were not talking, right? So for virologists, uh, yes, these guys induced type 1 interference. Immunologists wouldn't even, even know, right? So immunologists use viruses and try to understand, but, you know, not connection there. So we, we had these different perspectives. We were looking at uh, a lot more than type 1 interference. We were looking about how the whole adaptive immune response is developed and how this had an impact on that. Um, so we became very excited and tried to prove, uh, you know, whether these things that everybody had thought they were artifacts that were completely, um, uh, you know, an artifact of growing these viruses in vitro were actually uh, important in vivo. So I think the paper you're referring to is when we first time show that actually these defective genomes are what trigger the immune response in animals, I think that could be. And we also showed that in humans. So that's moved a lot forward and we're very excited about that. So in an animal with influenza virus having defective genomes triggers immunity? Right, so you don't, see, you don't see innate immune responses, and we've done that with a bunch of viruses. We focus mostly on paramyxoviruses, RSV, Sendai, but we've done that with flu. You don't really see a strong innate immunity turn on of the immune response until you have these defective genomes mm -hmm. uh, during infection. And this is interesting because when I was training, DIs were hot. And in mm -hmm. fact, Alice Wong made a career of saying these are important for disease, and it never went anywhere. Exactly. I don't think we had the tools to look at right. it. Right. I think that's then. a critical aspect. This is the this is the critical thing. I mean, the the idea has been around for a long time, but people quit it, right? Because there were no tools, and it was in the business is what considered an artifact, right? So until you show that this is relevant physiologically, uh, so yeah, that's what we keep very excited, and we keep digging deeper into all the different aspects of this. So if you infect mice, in this case in the lungs, um, without a, with a preparation that does not have uh, DIs in it, do they, are they generated during infection? Yes, yes. They so, are. so eventually they are, yeah. and it seems that it depends on how uh, quick and strong they are generated. It really controls virulence, right? So that's, that's become very clear. Uh, we don't no, enough. So there was no investment in this area anymore, right? So we don't really know what are the mechanisms that control their generation yet. So we are investing a lot of our energy in the lab trying to understand that. Once we understand that, we can generate tools, right? We can generate viruses that don't generate it. But it's really interesting that no matter what virus you look, it seems to be. And I, I would say, let's think RNA viruses, you know, for that mm, purpose yeah. right now. But uh, and, and, and in essential. people, do you see this as well? Yeah, we've seen it in people. We see it, we've done it with RSV, and we see it in patients. And uh, it coincides. I mean, so you, in a very, um, I would say, pilot kind of a study, just do we see them or not? Mm -hmm. uh, they are there. We can detect it in a significant about fifty percent of patients, and those have enhanced innate immunity. So that's interesting. Yeah. So we, it's very hard to make DIs with polio virus. Hard. Very hard. Uh, so someone in David Baltimore's lab years ago mm -hmm. did it. You have to pass many, many times at very high multiplicities, and then you will get them. But normally you can grow polio stocks at MOIF10, and it's no problem. So there may be some viruses where it's different, uh, RNA viruses at least. Maybe DIs don't play as much of a role. It would be interesting to see which ones. Right. Right. Do right. and don't. So we're trying to get into the polio world right now. We have a postdoc interested in that. Um, uh, not polio, but at least the coronaviruses. Uh, what, one of the interesting things is actually, retrospectively, it was realized that one of the successes of the polio vaccines were due to the eyes, right? To having some these the eyes. So, uh, yeah, it may be harder to form, but they seem to yeah. have the well, same I think for function. polio and pocornas. People really haven't looked very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so is this something that um, you want to pursue going forward? 
Yeah, yeah, in general, we're this pursuing. A, was this, would this be a major focus of your lab? Absolutely, it is mm -hmm. a major focus of the lab. Yes. And so you look at influenza, RS virus, what Par -par Paramixes, and we are now trying to do, uh, expand a little bit to some positive strands to mm -hmm. see if we see something. We're getting even into the co-evolution and evolution aspect of all this. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what, what, other, what other things excite you about viruses besides that? Well, the other aspect of my lab is pathogenesis. So we, we are very interested in virus pathogenesis, focusing a lot on respiratory pathogens, but we really care about the interaction of the virus with the immune system and how that turns into disease. So a lot of the viruses we work on um, are associated with chronic respiratory diseases, and they're all acute viruses, right? Uh, by the, the, the classical definition. So we're really interested in understanding how that happens. Um, uh, it's more, more and more evident that these acute viruses somehow persist, and we're really trying to dwell a little bit into that and understanding how that impacts the long-term chronic diseases. So, so one, one, one aspect of uh, virology that I really find interesting is, and it's driven by technology, is the ability to ask, what does the host do yeah. in this? And we can do it in people now, right? Is that something that interests you? Yeah, absolutely. I wish NIH found my grants and we can do more. Uh, it's not my fault. <laughs> I didn't do it. Was it. The question. No, we do have actually an enormous amount of um, sample, clinical samples in freezers right now that we're processing. Uh, particularly from the defective virus perspective, we really want to try to understand what is their impact on clinical outcome. Again, in the context of these viruses that are associated with chronic lung diseases, we're really interesting to know if that could serve as a tool, either as a prognosis tool or maybe somehow manipulate them. Well, remember, there are host factors that obviously play a role as well. So no matter what you find for the virus, the host, a mutation in a gene for yep. an innate protein or something else could make a big difference. Sure, absolutely. We're really heterogeneous, yes, right? Yes, And yeah. so now this idea that there's such a broad range of pathogenesis when you get infected, that's controlled by genetic and epigenetic mechanisms. And that's, that's, that's what I see exciting going forward. We can do that now. And here's a cool one, which I hope someday people will look into. You know, the polio uh, Sabin vaccine causes paralysis in one in one and a half million kids. They must have a polymorphism somewhere that does it because the vaccine is exactly the same and no one has ever showed any interest. So if, if you're interested in polio, you should think about doing that. Scott, I mean, let's talk a little bit about uh, your science. I noticed you have a lot of papers with John Udell. Yep, so I did a postdoc with John Udell. That's right. Okay. And that, that's where I first started getting interested in flu work. Uh, when I started my postdoc with Udell, he, he presented me with these 1950s JEM papers. Uh, <laughs> loosely at all, hammery at all. This, uh, excellent papers. And, and in those studies, they had mouse models of uh, flu infection. And, mm -hmm. and uh, even though you couldn't sequence virus back then, uh, there was, there was, uh, they passaged virus in the presence or in, in these mice that had uh, prior immunity to flu. And what they found was under, under those circumstances, you can get antigenic variants. Nothing was known about, you know, what kind of sequence would encode that or whatnot. Mm. So when I started as a postdoc, Udell said, you know, let's do this and let me you know, do this again in, in whatever the year it was, 2010. Uh, and uh, and so, so that was a lot of fun working through that. And uh, we, we, we discovered some interesting things that viruses evolve in different ways depending on the actual makeup of uh, 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 the composition of an antibody response, depending on uh, where uh, antibodies target the virus. And so when I started my own group seven years ago, I, I really sort of focused on, on that concept of, of examining antibody specificity uh, against flu viruses. And what we've discovered is that, that, that many, you know, we just talked about heterogeneity in the population. And, and sure enough, we, everyone in this room, we, we have different types of flu antibodies. Mm. Uh, uh, some of that is linked to genetic polymorphisms, but what we found is, uh, is a major driving factor of flu antibody specificity is our prior exposure history. Uh, some of us were, grew up in Chile, some of us grew up in New York City, um, some of us grew up in the 70s, you know, we were kids in the 70s, some of us are older. So depending on where we grew up and, and, and uh, what year we were, we were uh, uh, children, 
really dictates the kind of viruses that, that, that we've seen and, and we've discovered. And this is in line of uh, old studies that were first proposed by Tommy Francis and, and others at the University of Michigan. What we found is that these, these sort of early childhood infections, uh, uh, flu infections, they, they set you up for the rest of your life. And, and they sort of leave this immunological imprint. And it, it dictates how you'll respond to a flu virus 50 years later. It's pretty remarkable. That's different from many other viruses because you simply don't get reinfected, right? You get infected once with polio or measles, and that's it. So there's no, none of this happens with many, many other viruses. That's right. So with flu, you have this, this process of uh, antigenic shift where you have these new flu subtypes that occasionally come from animal reservoirs into, into humans. And then uh, more typically what you have is uh, once these viruses become uh, introduced into the human population, they undergo uh, a process called antigenic drift where they acquire mutations sort of on these external viral proteins. And so what does our immune system do? Our immune system produces antibodies that recognize these external proteins. And, and when you have a completely different subtype, well, wow, those external proteins are very different. If you have this process of antigenic drift, uh, uh, those external proteins uh, undergo these more minor changes, but those minor changes can have profound uh, uh, impacts where you can become reinfected. So yeah, it is an unusual situation where we uh, essentially, as humans, become infected with flu viruses. You know, every five years or so, we're infected. So I'm trying to think if there's any other virus like that. Um, certainly HIV is quite hypervariable. It can you know, it vary according to the antibody response, but I don't know, most people don't have multiple infections, right? Yeah, so, so HIV is, is interesting. If you just sort of look at evolution of HIV within an individual, it kind of looks yeah. like the evolution of flu over, huh. over 30 years. Uh, uh, but, but it is interesting to think about how, so, so why are we studying this process of antibody specificity? Well, ultimately, what we want to do is we want to be able to predict how the virus might move mm -hmm. in the future. Uh, your listeners may or may not know this, but flu vaccines, you have to kind of choose what, what uh, uh, vaccine antigens to include in the seasonal flu vaccine eight or nine months before the flu vac vaccine is actually distributed. So, you know, this is sort of a guessing game of trying to, trying to determine uh, what viruses might circulate in the upcoming year. And so our goal in our lab is to try to uh, uh, really come up with an immunological basis for that decision, to be able to not only uh, detect when viruses have undergone a huge mm -hmm. antigenic change that makes the vaccine or prior immunity uh, uh, less useful, but to actually predict what kind of mutations might emerge in the future. But didn't Yogi Berra said prediction is difficult, especially of the future? That's right. <laughs> yeah, with, with anything with flu, I mean, it's easy to sort of like, you know, uh, identify problems, but it's much harder to kind of look forward and uh, make predictions. But we're getting there. So, I mean, if you just, I've been in the flu field, I guess, 10 years, uh, for, for 10 years, had my lab for seven, did postdoc for three years. And even in that 10 year span, the amount of sequence data, for example, that's publicly available, it's just enormous. You know, people used to keep all these data guarded. You got, you got people like Trevor Bedford who are posting data in real time, making these phylogenetic tools where, you know, People like me can actually get in and, and, and identify these mutations early. Uh, uh, people in my lab, you know, once a mutation rises to 5% frequency, they're in there cloning these mutations by reverse genetics. Uh, uh, we have a tremendous amount of access to human samples here at Penn. We, 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 we uh, throw these uh, variant viruses into our assays to look for antigenic change. So stuff is moving much faster. And, 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 and I, 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 we're still at the point where making a prediction about flu, it's just you know, not a good idea. You're, you're bound to be wrong. But uh, I think we're in a completely different ball game than we were you know, 10 was, years ago. I was years. just going to ask you to make a prediction. <laughs> so do you think we're going to have an H5? pandemic or an H7 well, pandemic? So, you know, the, those are certainly the two subtypes that people are most worried about. And uh, there's really interesting data that sort of indicates that your childhood exposures, whether, so the, the, the subtypes that are circulating in humans right now are H3 and H1, and H2s have been around for uh, a, a brief period of time. But depending on your childhood first exposure, whether it was H1, H2, or H3, it actually dictates susceptibility to either H5 or H7. What we've learned is that there's some cross-reactive immunity between these 
you know, what we think of typically these seasonal viruses and these pandemic viruses. And so, you know, if it, we often take a reductionist view in trying to look at these antibodies. But now you try to predict what's going to emerge, H5 or H7. It's actually the population immunity. And so essentially, if people are more H3 imprinted, you would expect that they'd have cross-reactive antibodies against H7. Well, that would leave an immunological hole for H5 to jump in. And vice versa, if people were H2 or H1 imprinted, uh, what we know about uh, those antigens is that they would have cross-reactive immunity against H5 and allow H7 to jump in. So, <clears throat> so I will not dare predict whether H5 or H7 might emerge. Those are the two that we know are infecting humans. And there's, there's a number of uh, 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 changes in the virus that are probably required for those viruses to officially transmit from human to human. But another key component, which is often overlooked, is just the, po the, the immunity in the population. And, you know, how does, a population, how does population immunity change? Well, it changes if you're infected or not. But it also, in check, it, 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 it's really tied to birth rates and death rates. As, as we proceed into, into uh, uh, the, the future, what we have are less people where their immune system was, was trained on H1 viruses, because H1 viruses circulated from 1918 to 1957. Those, those people are leaving us. We, we, H3s have been around since 1968. So if you're, if you're born, for example, in the 1990s, you have much more of a chance to uh, uh, be initially infected with H3. So while it's hard to make these predictions, you know, in addition to sort of the, the, the uh, changes in the virus that might actually allow a pandemic to occur, you kind of have this extra layer of population immunity. Wow, people that have H1 immunity are sort of uh, uh, leaving the population. And as new kids are getting born, well, now you have a lot of H3 immunity. Well, that situation actually favors an H5 virus. Uh, but, you know, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, obviously a complicated thing. So for many kids, I would guess that immunization is actually their first encounter with flu. Isn't that right? something? So, yeah. so how does that influence what, how they re respond later on, as you're saying? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great question. Because everything that we study in the lab, or you know, all of us have been uh, imprinting is you know, sort of the new word, the new buzzword. We're, all of us are imprinted with uh, infection. So what happens now when you, uh, when you are vaccinated? Well, the kids now are vaccinated with multiple antigens. So you might expect them not to have a skewing towards an H1 versus an H3. There's H1s and H3s in there, but there probably is something special about infection. And you know, we know during infection you have much more of a robust response. Uh, you probably have uh, you know greater activation of germinal centers. Uh, and so you know, I I think vaccination probably delays your first infection, and that some of the that the imprinting is probably now just delayed five years which is good <laughs> because you should get vaccinated because if you're very young and you're infected with flu, that, that, could be, you know, that could be something fatal. So by vaccinating, I think we're just sort of delaying the inevitable, but we're getting, you know, we're, we're pushing kids into where their immune system is more mature. And, uh, but that's yet to be seen. Th those are exactly the kind of studies that have to go on now. Now, what's, what's going to happen to, you know, <clears throat> uh, kids that are born uh, over the last couple of years you know, we have seasonal flu vaccines for the first time. And it's, you know, so what happens when your immune system sees 70 uh, different hemagglutinins over the course of 70 years? You know, we haven't quite done that experiment yet. And yeah, so, it's ongoing, yeah. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how, yeah. that, how that plays in. In the light of this issue, is it better to receive an infectious attenuated flu vaccine compared with these chopped up things that we give yeah. most people? So, I mean, I think in theory, but... Uh, it might, so, as you may know, there, there, uh, uh, sort of the uh, intranasal vaccine was offered in the U.S. for a number of years and was taken off uh, the market last year because, uh, it, because it was not very effective. And, and that likely is some sort of production thing, is my understanding. So, you know, if the, if the vaccine is actually uh, prepared correctly, you know, that the live attenuated vaccine might elicit better immunity. And, you know, uh, I know my kids like to get a, a little uh, a squirt in their nose rather than a shot so that you, you get you actually get better vaccine uptake, I think, when you when you can offer that as a vaccine. I have an interesting story about that vaccine. When I was a graduate student in Peter's lab, we we got these cold adapted strains from Masab at the University of Michigan. And Peter gave them to me, he said, see if you can do something with these. And we forgot about them. Those turned out to be the basis of of the uh Metamune vaccine that are used today. They just took his cold adapted strains and modified them further. So I had them in my hands, but 
did nothing with them. Yeah. What about um, a universal flu vaccine approach, which you know many people are trying? Is that better in terms of imprinting? Because theoretically, it would no, it wouldn't be an issue anymore, right? Yeah, that's right. So you know, how do we lay out the best imprint, right? That's kind of uh, and so it's interesting at the NIH right now. There's uh, you know uh, a push towards developing programs with universal flu vaccines, and I think the the critical thing. Uh, that everyone is realizing that a universal flu vaccine is going to elicit different types of immunity in sort of an adult population compared to a pediatric population. We've all been imprinted, however we've been imprinted, and, and we kind of have to deal with it. We might be a lost cause, right? Um, you know, we're going to have to try to develop vaccines that elicit proper immunity in us as, as adults that have already seen flu. But it's probably a completely different story now, the strategy perhaps, if you're going to vaccinate the very young. You know, Tommy Francis coined the, the, the term original antigenic sin, and the sin was like, man, ch childhood exposure is such a great thing. You, you, have, you have such great immunity. Isn't it a sin that you, that you, that you don't have five antigens, essentially, that you're exposed to as, as, as children? And he ended that famous essay by, by saying, you know, I envision a world where there's chemically modified vaccine antigens where we can, where we can introduce a multitude of different antigens into, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, an immune system early on. And so I think that's where we're at, trying to, trying to come up with a universal flu vaccine that would you know, basically set the stage. You know, that's the dream, to, to immunize the very young and, and, and to set up their immune system to respond to age five and age seven. Uh, and uh, yeah, so everyone's very excited about it. As you probably know, there's interest in the stock, uh, hemagglutinin in stock, which is this conserved domain of that external uh, protein that I've been talking about on flu called hemagglutinin. <clears throat> and uh, there's 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 other strategies as well that are that are being pursued, and uh, it'll be really exciting to see how that that work moves forward. Well, this is great. Flu is great stuff, obviously, and uh, can talk about it a long time. But let's let's turn to Susan and your first paper, <coughs> early an early paper, 1977, that size and genetic composition of virus specific RNAs in the cytoplasm of cells producing avian sarcoma leukosis viruses, and both. Harold Varmus and Mike Bishop and you, the three authors. On that. There are only three. I forgot. Yeah, yeah, the three. Okay. So what were you doing? So that was a that was my f first thing I did as a postdoc, and um, the goal. Nobody really knew what the messenger RNAs of retroviruses or avian retroviruses were, mm -hmm. and um, so that was my job to, to delineate them. And that at that time, people ran sucrose gradients to isolate RNA, and gels were just becoming more popular. So I was going to run gels. And I think we used to, we, we would run RNA gels um, initially, they were, well, this is when I was graduating, they were tube gels initially, yeah, and you would sure. slice them with razor blades. Yeah. Do you remember that? <laughs> yes, I You'd do. have this razor blade contraption, and you'd put the gel down on it, yeah. and then you'd take the slices out, and then you would melt them, and either count them in the, um, in the simulation counter, or you would hybridize them with, with a probe, which was, was just early times yeah. for probes as well. But anyway, so um, I started running these gels I will initially sucrose gradients, and I would just get this mess. We all knew that there was a large genome. I forget how big it is already, but there was a genome, and then there were some smaller RNAs. And um, but it wasn't very uh, heterogeneous. It was very heterogeneous. And I did this for a really long time. And Harold said to me, uh, "Susan, can't you make RNA?" <laughs> I remember that because I, I'd done my whole thesis on RNA, and here I was really frustrated. So it turned out that the virus that I was using was um, was heterogeneous. There were there were uh, transformation defective genomes in there. So there were both full lengths, and then SARC would, would delete, the SARC gene would delete naturally um, from these, these viruses. And so um, I managed to get uh, I had a, a more homogeneous population. I think of it was all deletion. This is a long time ago, like 40 years ago. And um, so when I ran these viruses that were homogeneous, I got nice clean peaks on the gel. So I would get like um, a genome peak and then a smaller peak. And then when I ran the, the ones, uh, the non-defective viruses, there actually were three pieces. There was a genome peak, there was a, um, an N-SARC message, and then there was a, just a SARC message itself. And so all these, all these um, messages, so it seemed like the genome, this is pre-splicing, remember? So the genomes, so there were like, there were, we didn't understand why there were these sort of double bisystronic messages. There was, so there was a genome, there was a subgenomic uh, SARC env, and then an, I guess an env message. I can't remember the, gene, the order now, env message. And so, um, 
this all turned out to be due to splicing. So then we knew um, Barbara Baker in the lab was working on endogenous uh, chicken retrovirus genomes. And it became apparent that there were it looked like there were repeated sequences across the genome. And it turned out that really it was splicing. And the five prime end of the genome was spliced onto these two smaller messages. And this was really exciting because this all, we realized this just after the first splicing papers came out. And um, I, I got to give a talk at Cold Spring Harbor that year to, about these retrovirus messages. So it was quite exciting. I love hearing about older papers because the technology has changed so much, obviously. And, yeah. You know, you're running gels and sucrose gradients, and nowadays right. you would just deep sequence the whole yeah. RNA transcriptome from the cell, right, and figure out there, what's going on. There was no RNA cloning at that nothing, time. So nothing. You, you were really kind of stuck. And if you made a probe from RNA, you probably remember this. You, we, this is really amazing. We would take um, AMV, uh, retrovirus particles, treat them with detergent, and that was our source of RT. Yeah. And then we would use this crude prep to make, uh, yeah. make RNA. What was it like to work in the lab with Varmus and Bishop? Well, at that time, they weren't really Varmus and Bishop, <laughs> right? They were, you know, they were relatively yeah, young. Yeah, okay. uh, I mean, they were pretty prominent, but um, was pre-Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. Mike was, Mike turned 40 the year I went to the lab. That's how young he was. And he gave me his lab bench because that was the last experiments mm -hmm. he did. It was quite exciting because the two of them were incredibly brilliant and came up with ideas. And um, I always felt like as a postdoc, it was hard to have your own ideas, though, because these guys were so smart. Mm -hmm. And this was a huge lab. There were 30 people in the lab. And there were actually four PIs, two, two others besides them. And so we would meet with them every week. And um, it, it was a really exciting place to be. I, I really enjoyed it. Nobody wanted to leave. We all did very long postdoc periods there. So for your career, that was a key step, right? For me? Oh, yeah. yeah. Although I never worked on retroviruses again. Right. So you told us earlier you switched to yeah. coronavirus because you thought it would be less competitive. Well, that's not the only reason. I thought One it was really reasons. interesting. It is interesting. <laughs> it had to be interesting as yeah. well. But I wanted to know, so eventually SARS and then MERS emerged. Yeah. And do you think they fundamentally changed the coronavirus field, would it, because now it's quite a vibrant totally with a lot of people in it. Yeah, <laughs> Totally changed. Yeah. I mean, it was a sleepy little field originally. Um, I worked on the mouse model for MS, so it was like an MS model and, and also hepatitis model. And we did a lot of stuff with um, like tropism and pathogenesis. And it was, I, I thought it was, I still think it's a great model because it's a virus that you can do genetics on quite easily now. Mm -hmm. It wasn't true then, thanks to Ralph Barrick. Yeah, it was and a long time coming. It was a long time coming. System, yeah. I mean, from the time that you did the polio clone to the yeah. uh, coronavirus clone. And um, so it was really exciting from that perspective. Um, and, and we had, and you could obviously manipulate mice genetically. So you had the host and the virus and you could do all kinds of really neat studies that, that a lot of labs did. Um, and also the veterinary coronaviruses were pretty important. Mm -hmm. there, that was a big field, it still is, making vaccines for some of, some of the viruses that are really threats to, yeah. to agriculture. But anyway, so then, but it was kind of a sleepy field and there were not, I, I don't know the number of grants, but I think it was pretty small. And then SARS came. And when SARS came, uh, everyone in our field was like calling each other. I'm going, it's a coronavirus. <laughs> like, <laughs> like it's a, it was amazing. It was actually quite amazing. And, and I always say this, and I really believe this, it was only because of all the work we did on coronas that Ralph Barrett could, could clone it within, I think it was within weeks mm -hmm. of when it was, you know, the coronavirus particles were seen in pathology samples from patients. And, um, and then there was a, they identified it by, uh, there's a conserved region in the polymerase. They, people amplified little regions of, from samples, and it was pretty clear there was a coronavirus. And, and then everything broke crazy. Like, uh, I got uh, a grant that wasn't funded, became funded. Um, <laughs> seriously, we got um, supplements on our grants that year. So NIH was really um, amazing. And then uh, I got a phone call one day and said, um, would you like to go to China? And I said, well, yeah. And and they paid me to go to China to give a, like a 15-minute talk on coronaviruses. So it was really, it made our field so much more visible. And then, of course, the somewhat downside was that many, many people <laughs> jumped onto the field that had never worked on it before. And um, the, the, we had a meeting in the Netherlands. We have a, um, a meeting about every three years, that the one that you went to this year. It's now the NIDO virus meeting. And all kinds of people came to that meeting, people from other fields. And some of them stayed, but most, of, many of them left. And then and it, and it became a pretty interesting field. Then people started really looking for human coronaviruses. 
And there are other ones, and they're respiratory. None of them are quite as severe as SARS. And then as probably you might remember, but you guys may not, the SARS epidemic was very short. It was gone within six or eight months. It sort of died out and didn't really come back. And then it was quiet. And then, of course, 2012, which is about 10 years later, MERS came in, in the Middle East. Um, it never really took off to the extent that SARS did, but it gave a little boost to the field again. Um, I don't think it gave a boost at the NIH level this time like it did the first time. Um, and we started working on MERS because it became, there were MERS uh, sort of interestingly, so coronaviruses have, they're different, they're alpha, beta, gamma, delta coronaviruses, and they all have very similar conserved polymerase genes and structural genes. But this is, I'm getting a little uh, far afield, but they have very different um, small non-structural accessory genes. And those are the genes that interact with the immune system often. And those are very different among all the viruses. And we found um, that MERS had a pro encoded a protein very similar to the one in the MHV. And so that's, so we sort of transitioned into MERS through the study of that protein and, and host antagonism. So this so, idea that many new people come into a field yeah. when a virus emerges that's medically important. Uh, same thing happened with Zika and mm -hmm. Flavi virologists. Uh, many exactly. of the long-term Flavi virologists were complaining that so many people, everyone's a Flavi virologist, Michael Diamond said once, but that's what drives science forward. You get new people coming that's right. in. new ideas. And, and I think the idea that you build upon all this basic knowledge that you've gained with sleepy viruses, it, same yeah. thing happened with HIV was based on all the retrovirus That's right. Neil, work Nathanson. that came before that, you know, <laughs> good stuff. Uh, so maybe you could tell us about uh, this, this antagonist. I think you told me this story yeah. last year. It was fascinating, the OAS RNA cell antagonist. Oh, okay. how, did you, how did you come okay, across Okay, so that? this was really kind of crazy. So we had, um, let's, I'm trying to remember, there's a protein called NS2 encoded by coronaviruses. And I'm, trying, I'm trying to remember now how, you, how we even got started. Oh, I know. So nobody really knew what this protein did. And, and um, it's a funny story. Stuart Siddell's lab in England was trying, our student was trying to make an antibody against this protein to study it. And um, they, they, anyway, it turned out that the, that the wild type virus they were, they were working with had a deletion of this protein and it was perfectly pathogenic. It caused severe encephalitis in mice. Um, and so they couldn't figure out what this protein did. And they really wanted to know that. And at the same time, we, we had been interested in that protein. We knew it was a small protein in the cytoplasm of cells. And that's really all we knew about it. And um, so, so Stuart had made some, and it, oh, and we knew that it was an enzyme, that it was a phospho, it looked like a phosphodiesterase. They thought it was a cyclophosphodiesterase and that it participated in some pathway, they thought maybe with another viral protein, the ADRP protein. Um, but they couldn't really find anything wrong with it. And it, it, it even worked in vivo, it was potent in vivo. So they sent us the virus because they couldn't work in, in animals for some reason. And so um, what we did was um, we worked on both the liver and the brain infection. They had worked only in the brain. So we put this virus into mice and we found amazingly that while the virus replicated perfectly well and caused encephalitis, it was completely unable to cause hepatitis or replicate in the liver. So I think this was an example, I don't know too many other ones, of a, of a virulence factor that was completely specific for one organ and not another. But through this, I'll just as a little aside, we found out that that um, innate immunity in the in the brain um, was was much less intense than in the liver. The interferon response was less. Okay, so so then we're just trying to figure out what this protein did. And um, I had a postdoc, Ling Zhao, who's now back in China, and we were just trying to look at all these different knockout cells to figure out whether um, there was some innate some. Well, we, we've kind of figured out it had to do with interferon. I'm trying to remember. Oh, I know, because we, it could, this virus replicated perfectly well in tissue culture lines, but if we put the, a virus with a mutation in this enzymatic activity, it was completely dead in macrophages, bone marrow-derived macrophages. So we figured there was some, and we knew that, that MHV induced an interferon response in macrophages, but not in, in cell lines. And so Ling got his hands on every knockout macrophage we, we could possibly find that, would, that had innate ISG or interferon-stimulated gene knockouts. And uh, we got uh, Drew Weissman, who's here at Penn, happened to have these RNA cell knockout uh, cells, so, or, or mice with RNA cell knockout. And he gave us some bone marrow. We made macrophages. And amazingly, this virus completely re recovered replication in these macrophages. So I was like... 
a maze. I'd never seen, this, I'm talking about a virus that would grow to like six or seven logs in wild type macrophages. Um, and the mutant would, would replicate to maybe three logs. Or it was a, like a 10,000 fold difference in replication. And so when I saw that, I, I, I sent the data to Bob Silverman, who um, is worked on RNA cell for his whole career and had given the mice to Drew. And so um, I think when Bob saw the data, he immediately called me up and was, we were both like, wow, because he'd never seen. So, so the, the conclusion or the hypothesis was that this um, protein could completely inhibit ribonuclease L, which is a really potent antiviral uh, pathway. And it turned out that through a lot of work we did that, yes, this protein, uh, this NS2 protein had a 2 prime 5 prime phosphodiesterase activity that would cleave 2,5A, which is the activator of RNA cell. And it was really quite amazing because it turns out that lots of other, there are other viruses that inhibit this pathway by completely other mechanisms, but this was a really new um, protein. And it was really exciting for me, and it started my collaboration with, with Bob, which has been like for the last five or six years, we've collaborated really closely. And um, we found out that this, this, the only other virus group that had this protein was rotaviruses, which is completely unrelated to, to, to um, coronaviruses. The VP3 protein of um, rotaviruses has uh, the methylation enzymes on it, and it also has... Um, a two prime five prime phosphodiesterase on the three encodes on the on its C terminus. So that was so it's like in rotaviruses, it's like a um, a protein. It's like an RNA protection protein. That's how I think of it. It both caps the RNA and it prevents it from being cleaved by RNA cell. Um, and we don't understand did, did coronaviruses and rotaviruses get this um, protein separately? Did they pick it up? I'm the host. Yeah, I should also back up. We then found that there's a host enzyme. Um, called um, AD, I just forgot the name of it. Um, anyway, there's a host enzyme with the same activity, and uh, so these these viral and, and in the same virus group of these are all called 2H phosphodiesterases. So um, ACAP7 is uh, a kinase anchoring protein, is one of a huge group of family of proteins um, that have other functions that have nothing to do with this, but this one host protein has uh, phosphodiesterase domain encoded in its. Um, in, in its, the middle of it, and um, we don't know its function in the host cell, but, but we presume that the viral virus has picked up this protein from the host. Yeah, I like that story so, because it starts with seeing a motif yeah. in a protein. You brought it all the way through to the end. It and, started, I should say, with Sasha Gorbelenya, who yeah, yeah. Um, predicts or sees protein yeah. motifs. Yeah. I heard he's found a very big coronavirus. Did you hear that? I heard about it. He talked about it at that meeting. Yeah. I mean, huge. Yeah, how big is it? Um, 100 KB RNA, I think, wow. the biggest ever. So this puts the upper, or maybe now, I think it was 40 or 50, but he says now the theoretical upper limit for RNA is 100 KB. The, how do they figure that uh, out? You yeah. have to ask him. He does those I mean, the, the, the most regular coronavirus genomes are 31. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and the thought is it's limited by mutation, right? You can't get bigger because you have too many And we have this extra protein. But he says now the finding of a 40 or 50, or 50 KB means the upper limit is 100, but how okay. he got that. So we have 10 minutes. Let's, uh, let's go through and ask some uh, philosophical questions. Um, Scott, what do you think is the, the single accomplishment uh, that has given the most to science that you have done? <laughs> Just an easy, you know question. Well, pra we've done some practical things. Uh, so I, I talked about this, uh, this process of uh, updating a, a seasonal flu vaccine. Our lab has, has uh, showed uh, uh, that humans respond in a, in a diverse way, and that, that uh, has impacted how, uh, you know, how flu vaccines are chosen now. So historically, you know, there's always been antigen, antigenic characterizations of, uh, of different vaccine strains. It's largely been done with uh, antibodies isolated from animals that had, had seen flu. Uh, well, we found, as I've talked about, that humans are very different in how they respond to flu, uh, largely due to prior exposure history. So now, you know, based on our studies and obviously other people's studies, the WHO is taking that sort of human serological component into uh, more of a consideration in, in how vaccine strains are chosen. In fact, this year in the Northern Hemisphere, it's the first time uh, in history that the, uh, one of the flu uh, strains, the H1 component, has been updated despite the fact that animal serology 
indicates that the, the strains that are circulating now are no different than the old vaccine antigen. So it's pretty neat to kind of, you know, see some of these basic findings from the grad students in, in, a, in our lab sort of translate already to, uh, you know, making an impact on how the WHO does things in, in, in seven years. I mean, that's, pretty, that's a pretty uh, 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 short timeline. In the case of flu, the flu vaccines are updated every year. So that's like one part of virology where you don't have this sort of long, you know, 20 year, 30 year development of a basic discovery. It, it, can, it can happen pretty fast in, in the flu field. Gary, if you hadn't been a scientist, what would you have been? Uh, probably a pawn shop owner. <laughs> P-A-W-N, right? Uh, I, I, if, Right? It, it, it would be the other way if I had a pornograph to play it on. <laughs> okay, is that that's what you'd like to be? Huh? <sighs> I th that question is really from left field, and that's um, the idea. Yeah, I, I, you know, I yeah, that's that's the idea, and and I think the only answer I could say is at this moment nothing else. I don't think I would. I could envision being anything more uh, satisfying than what I've done. Okay, and, that's an answer. And, and thinking about what that's I've done. That's fine. Uh, David Baltimore once said, I asked him, do you have any advice for people who want to go in the field? And he said, if you can think of anything else you'd like to do <laughs> with your life, do it. <laughs> Instead of science. <laughs> I, I can't think of anything else. Um, now the question's out of the bag, but it's still fun. Uh, Carolina, would, what else would you have been besides a scientist? You're going to get asked too. Besides a scientist. So I said I liked astronomy. Um, yeah. Very hard. I don't know. I don't know. You don't uh, have an answer? Yeah. I think scientist is my thing was always what I want it to be. If you go back into old TWIVs, um, I've asked this of a lot of people and you get really interesting answers. Um, what about you, Susan? All right, well, one thing that, I, one thing that I've always thought would be fun to be is a talk show host. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd like to be like Terry Gross and interview all kinds, all of, kinds of people. people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that'd be really neat. Yeah. Well, you could work with us a little yeah. and get your skills home. I right? think that would be fun. <laughs> yeah, sure, <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Maybe I should move to Philadelphia and sure. <laughs> bring the studio here. Um, uh, Scott, what do you do for fun? What do I do for fun, huh? Uh, well, uh, yeah, my idea of fun's a lot different than it was you know, five or six years ago. So I'd, I'd say I'd spend most of my free time uh, you know, uh, playing with my kids and just kind of hanging out. But, uh, yeah, I remember the days when my wife and I would would drive, they take day trips to the beach to go surfing, you know, and that uh, that doesn't happen anymore because a day tri a trip to the beach is pretty tough with two little kids. But yeah, no, I spend a lot of time at home uh, hanging out with my kids. Gary, have you read any good books lately? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, and I assume you would like to. Sure, the, sure. Please share them with us. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm rather, uh, one, of, one of my favorite uh, writers is uh, Joyce Carol Oates. And I, uh, I've given up several things in life. I gave up comic books at 15. Um, other things, but I think I've given up Carol because she's gotten too dark for me. And uh, there, there, the book I really loved was A Gentleman in Moscow. If people haven't read it, uh, it it's just marvelous. And one that I'm reading now is called... Um, uh, Oh, uh, it, it's a Flemish book it, by a Flemish author, and it is called Sweat and Turpentine. And uh, I, I think what I truly enjoy is to rummage in the minds of these people uh, 
who are trying to rummage in their own minds and express themselves. So the answer is yes, okay. I've, I've read good. some you. good books. Uh, Carolina, do you have any advice for people, young people who are thinking of going into science? Yes, go for it. Uh, I would say have a plan and work towards it and there is nothing else to it, yes. Mm -hmm. If you really like it, you can do it. I could and I did everything very, very differently than the norm, so. Susan. I see little barriers, actually. Okay. Susan, um, we have a clearly anti-science administration. Mm -hmm. What do we do about it as scientists? Oh, God. <laughs> That's a tough one. <laughs> oh, hmm. I, God, I don't, I don't know how. Well, we do things like this, for one thing, to tell people what we're doing. Um, God, I have to think about that one. Okay. <laughs> Well, I think doing things we like tweet? this, is, but <laughs> I think we have to come up with things to do yeah. to fight back because um, otherwise it gets taken away from us, right? We do science for everyone, but it's being taken away by, you know, all the things the administration is doing. So we, we really need to think about how to yeah. combat it. I think it's an important question. Um, maybe our last question is, what should the title of this show be? Have you, you have any ideas? Do you have an idea, Susan? The title of this show. Hmm. You know, uh, I've Gary. I'll tell you, uh, I'll just say one thing, you know, I just mentioned when, when we all started virology, well, when, when we came, when I came here in 1980, there were not a whole lot of virologists, and Neil Nathanson was our new chair, and he had this concept of, he called it a department without walls, and I do think that, you know, we have a community here that spans mm -hmm. the whole university, all these different, well, yeah. Okay, I, I, I uh, absolutely agree. I, you know, when you ask the question about what to call it, uh, I mean, UPenn is a great sandbox for science. And uh, the, the university has touted the concept of uh, one university. And uh, it's been absolutely wonderful playing in this sandbox. And uh, the acceptance of everybody uh, across all of these schools uh, is really marvelous. I can't say unique since I haven't been anywhere else, but it's, it's, uh, I, I think the atmosphere is marvelous. And, and I, think, I think for these two guys here who are our future, right, I think they chime in and, and would agree with that, that concept. Yeah, it's tremendous. Uh, you, you don't even think about what department you're in or what graduate group you're affiliated with. It's uh, just complete uh, no balls here at all. A sandbox is a, all right, so a here really are good two, analogy. Here are two candidates for title. One is science without walls. Who likes that? And the other would be Penn, a great sandbox for science. Second. What happened? Okay. That one wins. I like the second one. You like yeah. the second pen, a great sandbox for science. So usually on TWIV, <laughs> on our normal episodes, after we, we finish talking, we talk about the titles, and we usually don't publish that. But now you get to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to publish it. What do you, am I going to publish this entire episode? No, no. <laughs> the, title. Yeah, gonna, the title is going to be Pen, okay. a great sandbox for science. <laughs> Unless you want to leave the pen out, but I think we should leave it in since we're here. Anyway, that is TWIV 460. You can find TWIV at Apple Podcasts. You can go to microbe.tv slash TWIV. If you have a, a phone or a tablet, you probably listen to podcasts on that. Who listens to podcasts on their phones? Yeah, most of you do and use some kind of app, right? Do me a favor. Subscribe right now to TWIV, okay? Even if you never listen to it again, I'd like you to subscribe because that helps us to get support for what we do. And... Um, if you really like what we do and you want to support us financially, you can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. We have Patreon. We have other ways you can do that as well. And if you have questions or comments, twiv at microbe.tv. I want to thank all of my guests today from the University of Pennsylvania. Susan Weiss, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for uh, reaching out and suggesting we do this. Actually, this started with the Science March in April. Uh, I met two people at breakfast. Are they here? You, and it was another person. My girlfriend. 
Your girlfriend. Is she still your girlfriend? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Good. And they Stephen were, up there too got in. Not there, but he was. He actually reached out a long time before. before, before yeah. But he he didn't push me enough, so you got to push me. Um, so at the science march, I went to breakfast, and you and, and your girlfriend. And they said, "Are you Vincent Racaniello?" <laughs> yes, I am. And then we talked, and we said, "Let's do a twiv at Penn to revive what Steve had done." So thanks for very much for doing that, Carolina Lopez. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Gary Cohen from Brooklyn. Thank you very much. Uh, this was an uh, absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. And uh, Scott Hensley. Thank you very much. Thanks. You only coughed like three times. Only three. It's really good job. <laughs> I would like to thank uh, the American Society. By the way, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.ws. You have a, you don't have a Twitter account, right? I do. What's your Twitter handle? I don't, re I don't remember. You don't remember? I don't use it enough. He doesn't use it. I'll figure it out and put it in the show notes. What's yours? CBLPHL. CBLPHL. And Gary, you don't have a Twitter account, oh, right? It's a T R U M P. Really? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, uh, what is that you, coming from? You have one as well, right? <laughs> yeah, my, my <laughs> Scott E. Hensley. Scott E. Hensley. Scott E. Hensley. Okay. Yeah. So I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me. I'm also on Twitter, P R O F V R R. I want to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV. Uh, I also want to thank the sponsor of this episode, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. The music you hear on the beginning of TWIV is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs> okay.